Cool. Uh, so my presentation is about Feynman's trick in the Big Bang Theory. Initially, I was going to make my whole presentation about little uh, math problems I found throughout, but once I found this trick and really started diving into it, I thought it was interesting enough that I could do my entire presentation on it. So I'll show you the first clip of where I found it. Go to notes. Show that I'm more than smart enough to take your class. <laughs> no. <laughs> yes. How would you determine the ground state of a quantum system with no exact solution? I would guess a wave function and then vary its parameters until I found the lowest energy solution. Hmm. <laughs> Do you know how to integrate x squared times e to the minus x without looking it up? I use Feynman's trick, differentiate under the integral sign. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, what is the correct interpretation of quantum mechanics? Since every interpretation gives exactly the same answer to every measurement, they're all equally correct. However, I know you believe in the many worlds interpretation, so I'll say that. Now, do you think I'm smart enough? <laughs> No. <laughs> so there, it's there's three examples there that um, he was trying to convince him, but it was that center one that I picked out that he said using Feynman's trick to integrate x squared times e to the negative x. But first, what is Feynman's trick? Well, Feynman's trick is a way for solving integrals by adding a variable and then differentiating under the interval. So it seems, when I initially start doing it, it will seem like I'm making it harder for myself. And it does look that way, but eventually it does work out to be much simpler. But first, who is Richard Feynman? Why do we, why do we you know, where, why do we care about this guy? Uh, Richard Feynman was an American physicist who um, did work on the Manhattan Project and did a lot with uh, quantum uh, particles and then even won the Nobel Prize for fundamental work on quantum electrodynamics. So, and you know, very big teacher, hopped around to a few different universities. Um, so he wasn't just known for this trick. In fact, from what I read about him, no one was even mentioning it. It was all about his work on the Manhattan Project and his work for the Nobel Prize and all the different uh, teaching he did. And just this famous trick just happened to uh, show up in that one episode, which is how I found it. But let's actually get to the trick now. So this is the equation that um, that he was asked to solve, is integrating x squared times e to the negative x. And he said doing it by Feynman's trick. Well, you definitely can do it by Feynman's trick, and that's what this first is. But you can also, if you just look at it, you can do it much easier by integration by parts which I'll have next, but if you were to do it by Feynman's trick, what it really means is finding a function with a different variable and being able to work it into that function. So for this equation, what that function ended up being was integrating e to the negative ax dx, so your function is f of a. From here then, and though it seems like, well, why would you ever make f of a? What you're really able to do is solve whatever you want, or put whatever value you want in for that a function, a variable, and solve it. So if you were to put one into there, you get e to the negative x dx. What we want to get is x squared e to the negative x dx. So by integrating or by differentiating one time, we're able to differentiate with respect to a, not with respect to x. So when we're doing that then, x is treated as a constant. When doing that then, you just have, have a simple exponential function. Your negative x gets brought down from the power, and it all stays inside the integral. Well, you do it one more time, and you get the same thing again. The negatives cancel out, you get your x squared e to the negative ax dx. And by inputting one into there then, you get the integral of x squared e to the negative x dx which is exactly what we're trying to find. So now, all we need to solve for is the second derivative of f with one inputted. So to get there, how are we gonna get there? Well, if you look all the way back 
the first f function, that integral of e to the negative ax dx. If we're looking at it and only treating one variable as a variable at a time, as well as um, then treating the other as a constant, when we did that with differentiating, x was treated as a constant. But when we have an integral um, that we're trying to solve with respect to x, that dx, when we integrate that to solve, to actually solve for f of a, we need to treat a as the constant. So by doing that then, you get your, you know, backing up, your a goes down underneath as a constant, and you have your plus c. Okay, well now that we've solved for f of a, all we need to do is get back to the second derivative. So, but now, when you're taking the derivative again, now a is your variable again because it's an f of a function. The only reason x was our variable when integrating is because it was dx. So when we differentiate one time, you get that off the quotient rule. And you may look up there and have a question of, why is that c still there? It doesn't look like it should be there, but it has to be because looking at how we got that c, we got that c by differentiating or integrating with respect to x up here. So then when we differentiate with respect to a, that value we, we got from integrating x is still there. Because there came out of two different variables, you're not able to just get rid of it when differentiating. So now that you have your first derivative, now taking a second derivative is nasty because you have to do quotient rule and product rule, but it does eventually come all the way out to that. And now that we're at our second derivative, all we have to do is input one in there, and all of our a's disappear, and we're left with negative e to the negative x, x squared plus two x plus two plus c. And because these two are now equal to each other, you're able to set them equal to each other, and you've solved. Okay, like I said, you can do that by, and this is doing it by Feynman's trick, but it, Feynman's trick is really only helpful if you do it on a function that you need to. This could very easily be solved by integration by parts. So if you do the same problem again, integration by parts this time, make your f x squared and your g prime e to the negative x, you do it one time, realize, okay, you still can't integrate that, do it one more time, and now you have two solved parts and an integral that you can solve, and you're able to get the same value much faster, much simpler, in a way that we can work out in our heads, and that's something we've done a lot. But what if there's a function that you cannot use integration by parts? This function, very similar to the last one, as you can see, all we've done is added bounds, be integrated between zero and infinity, Instead of having x squared, we have x to the n. So what this prevents us from doing is now we cannot do integration by parts. As trying to do integration by parts here, all we do is lessen the power of that x from n to n minus one and have an n up front, and we'd never be able to get rid of it because we do not know what n is. And this is where you need finding strength. So here, we're gonna first start not making a function right away, but just saying, okay, if we integrate e to the negative x between zero and infinity, we, still, we get one. If we then create that into a function, adding e to the negative ax, it works out to one over x, and that is going to be our function now. I threw this limit in here just as like a guide. When I first looked at that, I didn't exactly understand how adding a to the exponent would work it out to one over a, so I threw a limit in there that I needed to work it out, so that might help a little bit. But we found our function. We found our f of a. But we still only have e to the negative ax. There is no x yet. There's, we don't see where the n is coming in, but we'll get there. By taking the first derivative, you're able to take the derivative of the function, um, the derivative of the integral, and the derivative of this one over a. And when we take the derivative of all of that, that is how we'll eventually solve it, because we have that um, solution. And though it's in terms of a, it's still be able to, it's still going to benefit us. 
So our first derivative there, we end up with a negative on the outside, x to the first power, e to the negative ax dx, and then negative 1 over x squared, or a squared. When we take the derivative a second time, you can see that negative outside the integral disappears, the x rises to the second power, e to the negative ax is still the same, and now it's 2 over a cubed. So now let's look at a more general thing. If we take f to the nth derivative, it doesn't matter what n is, well, what patterns have we found here? We have found that on the first derivative, there's a negative, and on the second derivative, that negative disappears. So we're able to kind of write that out as a negative 1 to the nth power. As you can see, the x is going up by one every time we take the derivative, and that power matches the derivative that we're on. So it's x to the n, e to the negative ax, that never changed, to dx. And then let's look at our solution. It went from negative to positive with the derivatives. So we have that negative one to the n again. The top will be, because of the uh, quotient rule, or not even quotient rule, just the fact that the uh, variable is on the bottom, by doing that, we're multiplying by the variable, and the top will be n factorial, switching between positive and negative. And then the bottom will always be a n plus 1, just because on our you know, first derivative, it's a to the second, second derivative is a to the third, so it's always going to be 1 greater than our derivative. For here, then, we can say, okay, what value um, did we need to input in here? Well, all the way back you know, what valuable, or what value could we put in for that a value to be able to solve it out? Well, we have our integral, we have the x to the n. The only thing that's in there is e to the negative ax needs to be e to the negative x. So what we're gonna end up doing is inputting one in for our a value. And by doing that, you get, all that then disappears is the variable, or is the, yeah, the variable in the exponent on that uh, Euler's number, as well as the uh, denominator in our answer. So now we just have n factorial multiplied by negative 1 to the n. And by doing that then, we're able to divide out our negative 1 to the n power, and we're able to solve the integral between 0 and infinity for x of n, e to the negative x dx is n factorial. But that's very similar to the one we had done back here, just instead of a two, we have an n. So what about a function that you absolutely need Feynman strength for? It doesn't look that hard. You know, the integrating between zero and infinity for sine of x over x dx. It doesn't look that hard because, okay, you have a pretty basic trig function, divided by x shouldn't be that bad. But the problem is, if you ever try to integrate that, that x on the bottom is what stops you, because you're not able to undo that quotient rule. So what we're actually going to do here is when we create our function, we're going to add e to the negative ax. And this is where it begins to look like you're adding way too complex variables and that you're never going to be able to solve it. But just examining the function we've made now, Inputting 0 into there, we're going to end up with e to the 0, which is equal to 1, and we're going to get our original function. So all we're really trying to find is f of 0. But of course, to get where we want to go, we have to go farther away. So we're going to first start by taking the derivative. Because we're taking the derivative in terms of a and not in terms of x, a is treated as our variable. Sine, over x, the sine of x over x gets treated as a constant. Uh, the x in the exponent gets treated as a constant. So our negative x comes down, the negative stays there, the x's divide out, and then we're left with sine x times negative e to the negative ax. This is actually a problem we can solve by integration by parts. So what I'm going to do is actually, by solving it, I'm going to ignore the bounds for now, is all we need to do is find the antiderivative um, and then work it out in those bounds. So when I first start doing integration by parts, using Lippet, our exponential is going to be our f, our negative e to the 
negative ax, and our g prime is gonna end up being the trig sine x. And doing it one time, we're able to solve for e to the negative x cosine x plus a, the integral for e to the negative ax cosine x dx. Doesn't look like it's gotten any better. You still have an exponentially, you still have a trig function, and it hasn't gotten any better. You do it one more time, solve for a second, um, a second term, and your values for f and g prime are just about the same. But when you do it now, you're able to find that second term, that a e to the negative x sine x minus a squared, the integral sine x times negative e to the negative ax dx. Well, if you look at that now, this <coughs> integral is the same as this integral. And they're both still equal to f prime of a. All we're trying to do here is solve for this integral. So what we're able to do is set the two equal to each other. And by doing that then, these two terms are on their own. These can be treated as both having the same integral and therefore can be combined by like terms so that you end up with your first two terms here is equal to a squared plus one, that a squared coming from here and the one coming from that one, the integral of sine x times negative e to the negative ax dx. Uh, I'm gonna jump ahead just the next slide, but same uh, equation, I haven't changed anything. So right about to, what we're able to do from here then is simply divide across those coefficients and solve for the integral you're trying to solve for, and therefore f prime of a is equal to e to the negative ax cosine x plus a sine e, a e to the negative ax sine x over a squared plus one, still um, integrated between zero and infinity. All I did is bump those off to solve for the answer derivative. So we actually do that then. First, I simplified just to make it easier on myself. When you put your infinities in there, you're gonna get left with e to the negative infinity. And this, these, when actually looking at it, this is coming from integral um, looking at x. You know, the dx here. So a is actually not affected at all. It's, we're putting these zero and infinity values into x. So when we get e to the negative ax, okay, we'll get e to the negative infinity. If you were to flip it to the bottom, on the bottom you'd have e to the infinity, it's gonna be infinitely large, and that first term's gonna be zero. And then subtract the second term, and just inputting all your zeros in, you're gonna get e to the zero, cos times, and e to the zero is one. Cosine zero plus a sine zero, cosine zero is one, sine of zero is zero, so that goes away. You're left with negative one over a squared plus one, and here is much easier. Remember, we're trying to get back to f of zero is the value we need. So by integrating this function, we end up getting negative arctangent of a plus c. And you might think, okay, why don't you just throw your zero in there now? Okay, well, if you throw zero in there, you're left arctangent of zero plus c. Well, we have no idea what that c value is. All we've done is solved for f of a. So what we actually have to do is set that, that negative arctangent of a plus c, all the way back equal to that original first nasty <laughs> integral we had, setting it equal to that sine x over x times e to the negative a x dx. And by doing that, what we're gonna do is input a value for a, but instead of putting a value in that we wouldn't be able to solve for, because we still don't know the value of this integral, what we're actually going to do is evaluate it as a approaches infinity. So you have our negative arctangent of infinity plus c is equal to the integral between zero and infinity sine x over x, and that e to the negative infinity x is gonna, because it grows infinitely large, it's negative, it is going to go to zero, and then you're gonna be left with an integral of zero, which is always zero, and negative arctangent of infinity is going to grow out to negative pi over two. So you'll have to negative pi over two plus c, is equal to zero, c then is pi over two, plug that back into our function, f of a is equal to negative arctangent of a plus pi over two, input your zero in there, arctangent of zero is zero, you have to solve for pi over two, 
and you're able to solve that all the way back to the beginning. So the integral between zero and infinity of sine x over x dx is equal to pi over two. And that is the main use of Feynman's trick, is being able to solve integrals that you would never be able to solve any other way. Being able to create a function out of, or being able to add terms to a function or multiply the function by some other arbitrary value that we're able to solve out to solve the function. And all I've got left is sources. So that's my thing.